Who doesn't love a good story? Right? Everybody loves a good story. And this, this show, Big Fish, is full of great stories. But your lives are full of great stories as well. So we're going to spend a couple of weeks considering the stories of our lives, the stories that we read about in Scripture, and the stories of one Edward Bloom. Because everybody loves a good story, right? Whether it's a, whether it's a fish tale, right? A big fish tale, like the one that got away, right? It keeps going like this. It was this big right at the boat. Or the true stories of our lives, those moments in history, those moments in time that we never forget, that change us really forever from then on. The story of Peter walking on the water has always been one of my favorites in all of Scripture. I, 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 I preach on it probably more than any other single text. And so I was almost resistant to pick it for this sort of launching point of the series. But it's just too good a fit. I'd love to paint the picture of this particular story in Scripture. You know, just go in your mind's eye to the, to the Scripture that Danielle just read and, and just imagine it. Imagine the disciples out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee on a dark and stormy night when the waves are getting big and rolling up over the gunnels of that little simple boat. Imagine how scared they must have been to be at the mercy of the wind and the waves and the storm. And then imagine just in the, in the peak of their fear, they see in the distance, there's, there's somebody out there, there's somebody on the water that's walking towards them. And, and you'd think like maybe they'd be excited, but wouldn't you be a little scared? They were. They were so scared. One of them said, it's a ghost. But just then, but just then they realized it's not a ghost. It's actually Jesus. Jesus to the rescue. In the Gospel of Matthew, also in Mark and John, the same story up to this point. But this is where Matthew is different from the others. Remember, Luke doesn't tell this story at all. But in Matthew, after Jesus says, it is I, Peter says, right. You know, Peter, his mouth engages before his brain, right? Right. If it's you, tell me to come out. And Jesus calls him on it. He says, come on out, see for yourself. And that's what Peter does. And it's that, that boat moment for Peter. A lot like the boat moments we all have in our lives when we decide to step out and take a risk. Peter steps out. And we wonder, was that a moment of courage or a moment of crazy? We don't know yet. But as the story unfolds, he goes to him and the waves are getting bigger and all of a sudden Peter loses sight of Jesus and so he starts to sink, right? And just at the moment that the waves are about to come in over his head, I, I can imagine him starting to get the, the water into his eyes and he's, and, he's, and he's crying out, he's reaching out and just then Jesus reaches down and pulls him maybe halfway out of the water just to make sure he's still got his attention, right? Pulls him halfway up out and says, what happened? Peter, why'd you lose your nerve? Don't you trust me? And then they went back to the boat together and they worshiped. It has always been one of my favorite stories. Since my mother read it to me as she bounced me on her knees. And I'll never forget the first time I was getting ready to use it in a talk with a bunch of teenagers at camp a long time ago. And I remember telling my mentor what I was planning to do with it. And I remember calling it a story, and he stopped me before the word story was even out of, a, out of my mouth. And he said, don't call what Peter did a story. He said, Matthew 14 is an account. It's an accounting of something that happened. And in that moment... A dilemma began in my heart that continues to this day. 
the dilemma and the difference between what we call a story and what we consider to be an account. The dilemma is not only about Peter's miraculous walking on water, but about many other things that I read in the Bible. I'm glad the fifth graders are here today. Last year, we gave you your first Bible, so you've heard all this before. You guys are the experts in the room. Trust me. It's not just about this single story. It's about many other things that we read in Scripture. For me, was Peter's big night in the storm from Matthew 14, was it a a tall tale or an account of gospel truth? Is it just a story that got bigger and bigger and bigger like the fish that got away? Or an actual, factual, miraculous moment that really happened in history? You know, sometimes when I read scripture, I think, gosh, I wish they had cell phones back then. (laughs) Right? Because what would have happened in the boat? Everybody in the boat would have pulled out their cell phone. They would have been click and record, you know. And and we'd have a record of it, right? We could watch this video. We could see Jesus. We could see Peter. But you know what? I'm kind of glad they didn't have cell phones back then. This is forcing me to take this one on faith. And you too. Many of you will have already worked this out for yourself. You probably land in one of maybe a couple different categories. First of all, that this must have happened. That Peter must have walked on water as a fact. Or else it holds no real power over your life. That, that's where some of you in this room are for sure. Others of you say it couldn't have possibly had happened. It's just a tall tale from 2,000 years ago when everything was just a story. Or perhaps you're in that third space, that third space of wonder, of inquiry, of plumbing the depths of a tall tale for the gospel truths contained therein. I don't know about you, but I sure would love to ask Peter. I'd love to go straight to the source, and I hope someday to get the chance. That's still up in the air. But I'd want to go to Peter and go, Peter, did it happen? Who got it right? Was it Matthew? Did you actually step out of the boat, or was it Mark and John who said just Peter walked, or just Jesus walked out and then calmed the sun? Or, or, or was it Luke? Did Luke get it right? Didn't even remember it. I'd want to ask him. I want to ask him straight up, was it a tall tale? A big fish story like the ones we sometimes tell our kids and grandkids to help them just fall asleep at night? I'd want to ask Peter, I, I would want to, I'd, I'd want to say, Peter, did you run home that night? As soon as you got home, did you wake up your whole family and tell them right away about this amazing thing that just happened, that you, that you walked on water? Or, or was it a few days later when you, when you really wanted to get your family's attention so that you could tell them something really important about this guy named Jesus that you've been following around? Oh, I'd, I'd love to ask Peter directly, you know, but, but we don't get to. So we're left with the same question and the same dilemma that I have wrestled with for 30 years now. Is it true? After many years and over those decades, I've come to embrace a different question. And it's a harder question to be sure. And that question is, what does it mean? No matter where you land and how you hold scripture, the question of what does it mean matters. You know, because even when we know something didn't actually happen, we can still ask, what does it mean? That's the whole point of the story of Edward Bloom. This guy, this character in the show, tells all these stories to family and to friends, never to deceive them or to harm them in any way, but to teach, to instill meaning in life. Whether it be through a witch that showed him how he dies, 
or a giant that's afraid to come out of his cave because he's different from everyone else, or the ringmaster with a secret that he's never told anyone. Lessons are learned. Meaning is result, revealed. Truth is discovered. For Edward Bloom and for all of us, the sharing of stories becomes a two-way blessing. I've told some of you this, I'll tell all of you now. My dad came to visit at Christmas this year because it was the only time in 2019 that all six of us, Sheila and I and our four kids, were going to be home for more than just a day or two. So my dad came and we had seven glorious days together. And I mean it, they were glorious. Glorious has a very broad meaning, by the way, just so you know. It was seven awesome days. What we decided at the beginning of the week is that we were going to have a sit-down meal every day. Some days it was lunch, some days it was dinner, and I asked my dad to, in very small installments, tell his life story to my kids about his parents and his grandparents, their great-grandparents, and what it was like to have his three big brothers that were his heroes go off to World War Two, and what was it like to be left behind and then what was it like to grow up and grow old and, and all the things with his family it was, it was beautiful I mean it was just sacred every moment of it I had to be clear when I told him I said dad look you got to tell the truth no exaggerations this time pop because he's good with fishtails but it was a blessing for both him and for us he cried more than the rest of us combined. We learned things. He learned things. Whenever I've told people that story about what we did this Christmas, they almost ask me, did you record it? It's fascinating how quick that question comes to people. I never even thought to record it. And so we didn't, and I'm really glad that we didn't. Because a few years down the road from now, I don't want the facts of my dad's story to get in the way of the truth of my dad's story. So I can hear you out there. I can hear you saying to yourself, but JR, we're not talking about a Broadway production. We're not talking about your dad. We're talking about holy and sacred scripture. And I say, you're right. We can't treat all the stories of our lives the same. We have to hold them differently. That's an appropriate and responsible approach to it. In the Bible, there's a book called Hebrews. It's a letter written to people a long time ago, not long after Jesus died, not long after his resurrection, and it was written as a letter of encouragement to people who are having a hard time sorting things out. Maybe like we still are today, sorting these things out. In that letter to the Hebrews in the 11th chapter, the author offers a powerful line that can help us still today. It is written there, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. It's the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. So back to Peter, as told to us by Matthew, is it true? What does it mean? What hope can it produce? Whether Peter walked on the water or not, whether it's a story or an account, whether it's a tall tale or it's gospel truth, it can give meaning to our lives. And it produces a hope that never fails. Follow that. Truth, meaning, hope. You got it? Truth, meaning, and hope. The truth is that Jesus comes to us in the storms of our lives. That means that we're never alone, even in our darkest, stormiest nights. So I hope that when I lose sight of Jesus through the waves of life, that he'll pull me up and remind me that he loves me and cares for me. Truth, meaning, hope. It's true that when we stay focused on Jesus, we can do things we never thought possible. That means all we have to do is take the next right step before us. 
I hope I have the crazy courage of Peter to step out of the safety and the comfort of the boat of my life. Truth, meaning, hope. It's true that fear can sink us. That means we should worship more than we worry. And I hope that God will remind me of all these gospel truths even in a world filled with tall tales. Truth, meaning, hope. Brene Brown recently wrote, owning our story can be hard, but not nearly as difficult as spending our lives running from it. So I have a homework assignment for you today. Kids, are you still listening? They're the only ones. I have a homework assignment for you. Because I think Brene Brown is right. I think that owning our story can be hard, but not nearly as difficult as, as spending our whole lives running from that story. So my homework assignment for you is simply this. I want you to reflect on the stories of your life. And most especially, I want you to reflect on and think about those stories that are like tall tales, you know, the stories that get bigger every time, like the one that got away. And I want you to sit down with somebody, and it has to be face-to-face. -face. You don't get to text or FaceTime this one. You got to sit down, okay? And I want you to tell that story. Take the time to tell it. Look for the truth. Find the meanings. And embrace the hope that it produces. Tell it to a family member. That would be my first invitation to you. Tell it to a family member. And I know some of you don't have any family members left. So tell it to a friend. And you know what? If you don't have a friend, I want you to call me. Okay? But share that story with someone. Tell someone your story. Look for the truth. Seek out the meaning. And proclaim the hope that it produces. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we're so thankful for the tall tales and the gospel truths of our lives. We pray in this moment that you would be the hero of our stories, that you would be the hero, not us. Make that so, O oh God, by helping us to embrace the truth of your love, what that means to the world, and help us to always, always, always be people of hope. Amen.